Welcome to creating the Stories of Filmation uh, panel. Um, my name is Zadok Angel. I co-created the He-Man and She-Ra episode review website in the late 90s. And uh, I work here in Los Angeles as a literary manager at Echo Lake Entertainment. I actually represent writers and directors who work in TV and animation and film. And uh, have a big soft spot for writers uh, like, our, like our panelists. Um, so today our topic is creating the Stories of Filmation. And we'll take you behind the scenes of the time that you guys spent creating and writing and directing the stories of He-Man and She-Ra. Um, I'll introduce our panelists. Um, right to my left is Roby Gorin. Um, Roby wrote many seminal episodes of He-Man in season two. Also wrote on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mario Brothers, Sonic the Hedgehog, Three's Company, and Hollywood Squares. And laughing. And yeah. laughing. Yeah. <laughs> 50 years ago on laughing. <laughs> Next, we have Robbie London. Robbie wrote seminal episodes of He-Man in season one, including the pilot. He also uh, is a producer on many series, including The Real Ghostbusters, the early 90s G.I. Joe, Captain Planet and the Planeteers, and Sonic the Hedgehog. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Robert Lamb, uh, who wrote many seminal episodes of He-Man in season two and She-Ra in season one. He also is a storyboard artist at Filmation and worked on Fat Albert, Ghostbusters, Black Star, Shazam, and Brave Star. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Tom Tataranowitz. Oh, I knew I was going to say it wrong. <laughs> Tataranowitz, uh, who worked on He-Man and She-Ra in He-Man season two and She-Ra seasons one and two, all the way to the end. He also worked on Brave Star, The Legend, Biker Mice, from Mars, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, and Aladdin and Lion King. Welcome, Tom. So uh, I wanted to start by asking uh, a question for each of you. Um, I find that all creative people who you know, venture from places like Nashville and Michigan and Pennsylvania to come out to Hollywood to pursue your dreams tend to have some thing in their childhood that inspired them, that you fell in love with, that made you want to pursue a creative career. And I'd love to hear from each of you what, what it was that inspired you to pursue a career in animation and in, in television. Roby? Well, I mean, when I was a little kid, I was the funny kid. You know, I was always doing the jokes. And that's just how it was. I was just a funny guy. And... Um, I really wanted to be more of a performer, believe it or not, but I ended up uh, writing television because, uh, well, I liked certain television shows that I saw, so I would write spec scripts, and there was a show called The Munsters, and I wrote a spec script for that, and then didn't, didn't buy it. I wrote one for uh, Green Acres, a spec script, which actually, I had a meeting with them, and they were actually thinking of hiring me, because CBS was going to buy another show, but uh, from them, they couldn't do it. And I, that, I was like 18 years old. So I kept writing jokes. I mean, I was a funny kid. And, uh, but I never intended animation. I was writing you know, live action television. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then one day I got a call from Filmation, and that's what changed. That's how I ended up writing animation. And it was a very interesting change of writing styles. I actually wrote some, maybe some of my best work in animation because I wrote so much of it. Uh, it's like writing Pulp Fiction. We had to write a ton of it, a ton of, ton of writing. And the, and the actors would actually uh, uh, come in and, and record what we wrote. Whereas we do, when you do a situation comedy, they're always saying we don't like that line because they're on camera. You know, they want it all rewritten. But they wrote what we wrote. They, they recorded what we wrote. So it was very good training for me. So that's sort of about how I got it by accident in a, an animation. I never intended to do it. Yeah, and, and Lou Scheimer, in many of his interviews, loved that he brought in writers who were not from a traditional animation background, who did yeah. live action or movies or things like that. Well, I got like a call. That. They wanted a Fat Albert writers, and I said, I, I don't know how to do that. I wouldn't know how to do Fat Albert. But that's how I got into it with Fat Albert. And then when Fat Albert was finished, I said, I was ready to say goodbye. And he said, no, we want you to stay. Next week, we start second season of He-Man. And I said, well, I, I don't know what that's about. Goodbye some more. And I'll tell you, if you want, <laughs> how I... <laughs> got away with writing He-Man, but I think that'll be another question. Okay, yeah, we'll get to okay. that, sure. Uh, Robbie? 
Well, uh, unlike those who emigrated here, I actually grew up in the west side of LA, so I was sort of felt surrounded by uh, showbiz. And, uh, and in some sense, it was in my blood, although my parents were not in that industry, but it was just there everywhere and appealed to me. Uh, in terms of childhood, I can't think of any one thing, but of course, like, like most people, I, got, I had my obsessions. And I think one sort of funny story, interesting story maybe, is my biggest obsession in childhood was Zorro. And to the degree that I was taking fencing lessons at seven years old, I mean, I was obsessed. And you know, doing the ZZZ on the walls of my house, which were not really appreciated. But um, so I, when I, the day I walked into Filmation for my very first day there as a tryout, I had no idea what I was going to be doing, and uh, my boss, Arthur Nadell, who's a wonderful man, late Arthur Nadell, uh, said to me, uh, Robbie, uh, we're working on this show called Zorro. Do you know anything about this show? And I thought, I'm off to a good start in this career. And, and uh, it worked out pretty well for me. That's great. Uh, Robert? All right. Well, my childhood was uh, misspent many hours every Saturday morning, glued in front of the TV, watching every cartoon that I could possibly watch, frustrated at the fact that sometimes the cartoons that I wanted to watch were on at the same time, and this was pre-videotape. So I'd have to uh, watch one season of, of one show and then watch the reruns of the uh, other show I wanted to see and so on. I love Johnny Quest and Space Ghost and uh, shows like that. I was love the Superman and, and Batman and Aquaman shows that uh, Filmation started out with, and the Archies and so on. Um, I, want, I thought I wanted to be a comic strip artist for uh, you know Sunday Funnies. I, I thought I wanted to do uh, uh, comic books. I tried a whole bunch of different things. And I think it was um, Disney animation that really pushed me in that direction. So I, I came out to California from, from Arizona to uh, break into the animation business. I wasn't quite... Up, up to the uh, Disney League, and you know, tried odd things around uh, Los Angeles while I was trying to find a way to, to break in, and I just hit on uh, Filmation needed storyboard artists in 1981. There was a shortage, and they had sold a lot of shows, and they took a chance on me, and I was uh, I was thrilled to pieces to be able to actually be working on uh, TV shows. Uh, that year was Shazam and Hero High and Black Star and Zorro. Uh, I did two Zorro boards, and that was uh, that was just. I look at them in shame because the, my drawing was really poor back then. But I got better, a lot of practice, working with great people. So that was my entrance. Now, for writing, uh, in, in first season He Man, I was a storyboard artist, and I got great scripts, loved them, and couldn't wait for the second season of He Man and the first. Script or two weren't quite as good as the ones I had in season one, and I go, Ooh, why don't we do some of the things that are in the show Bible that I don't see here? And I uh, came up with a story, and I pitched it to Arthur, really wanting Larry Dottilio to write it for me, because I liked his scripts. But Larry was busy, and Arthur said, you want to give it a try? And I said, uh... Yeah, sure, I'll do it. And so, so I'm I'm doing storyboards by day, and at night I'm I'm typing on a little brother typewriter uh, my first script, and uh, Arthur liked it, and he uh, uh, so Into the Abyss became a, a show in production, and he said, "You got another one?" I go, "Yeah, I got another one." And <laughs> what am I going to do? And I ended up uh, uh, I knew a, a, a blind. Uh, girl at my church, and I thought, what if I did a story about He-Man and, and a blind child? And that became Not So Blind, and on the strength of that uh, episode, Arthur offered me a staff position, so I moved from storyboard to um, uh, staff writer for the rest of the first season He-Man and, uh, second season He-Man and first, uh, <laughs> and, second, and first season She-Ra. Thank you. Tom? Um, why did I come to Los Angeles to work in animation? I grew up in Detroit. That's about all you need to say, really. <laughs> um, but what it was is, you know, like everybody, I watched cartoons and I, I loved comic books. And I went to art school. And uh, a book came out about in the early 70s. It was Christopher Finch's Art of Walt Disney. 
and it was, uh, it, you never saw a book like that for animations or anything. So I looked at it, I go, wow, look at this. So I graduated from art school and I go, well, what am I gonna do with art in Detroit? I don't wanna draw cars. <laughs> and so then it, oddly enough in the paper, Detroit paper, they were saying Hanna-Barbera was doing a film called Heidi's Song. And so I thought, well, I'll go to California and I'll work on that and I'll show them how to draw. Because clearly it's a bunch of old men and they're all dying and I'll go, go there and uh, wake this field up. So moved out to California, the pr proverbial story of like $100 in my pocket, some portfolio that was way outsized for what I should be carting around, no car, no anything. The woman, Debbie, who became my wife, she came out too, and we just had to, we were hitchhiking around town, fighting on corners, people, car would pull up, they'd let us in the car, and we'd be arguing in the car, and they'd take us to a meeting. It, it, was, it was something else. But I went to Disney, and they were like Rob's story. They were suitably unimpressed. And then I found out that Los Angeles, everybody that left art school in Los Angeles went into animation. They weren't looking for people particularly. So I did some other stuff. And then there was an ad in Variety for Ralph Bakshi advertising for artists for Lord of the Rings. And the key was artists, not animators, because he was looking for just anybody that could do anything. And so I turned in my portfolio, and it was, it was a mess. It was big frame things that weighed 10 pounds each. It was a, but I got hired and fired and hired. That's kind of my want in life. And, uh, and so then I did that, and then that ended, and I went, then I finally ended up working on Heidi's Song with Hanna-Barbera, oddly enough, as an animator. And then um, worked on Fire and Ice with Bakshi as an animator, did stuff. And then film eight. Then it got to, there was a bad time in the animation industry. The industry was about dying in Los Angeles. There wasn't any work, really. We had had a, a, a rough strike. And all of a sudden, I heard that, oh, well, Filmation's doing these things. So I went and I said, well, I'm just going to take any test that they have. I don't care. And so I took an animation test, and I took a layout test, and I took a storyboard test. And they hired me in the Filmation way for model design. I don't know. That's the way that place rolled, kind of. And so, because I could draw muscles, because I worked with Frazetta, Frank Frazetta on Fire and Ice, and I could draw pretty girls, so I did that. And then finally, then they brought me into Storyboard eventually. And so, the best thing about Filmation was uh, it was kind of like a school. You could learn everything, and they would pay you, no matter how lousy you were to begin with, if they had some skill. And you could develop it because you were drawing 40 hours a day, 40 hours a week, eight hours a day, 365 days a year on, on the syndicated stuff. And so from there, uh, it, it, you developed skills, you developed relationships. I ended up working on stories for uh, before I became a director at Filmation uh, with Bob Ford, because he and I were roommates. And Little kids in this room, I can't see. Anyway, we, we weren't the straightest guys in there, but as far as, we did a lot of drinking. Um, and, so, and so I came up with this idea for a show called Princess, uh, Price of, Problem with Power, where He-Man would kill somebody. And Arthur Nadell wasn't gonna cotton to somebody being killed, so we had to change it to somebody pretending they were killed. And, but the, people seem to have liked that episode, and then I became a director from there, and went, went on from that and did work on running Marvel and doing all kinds of stuff. Was it, uh, both Robert and Tom, you guys transitioned from being storyboard artists to, to writers. Was that, was that out of design? Was that the goal, like, hey, I'm getting in my foot in the door and I want to be a writer? Or was it just an organic uh, transition for both of you? Well, for, for me, it was, I really don't like the last two scripts I got. <laughs> There's got to be some better mm. stories out there. Those must have been mine. Oh, no, you were gone. Then they were yeah. mine. <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> no. But but uh, but that happens in any series of them. There's a, a lot of uh, uh, turnover. You get uh, freelance writers who maybe not be as clear uh, with the concept and everything. But um, and also I was I was a, a bit of a jerk at, at you know 27 years of age and and uh, thought I could do things better. But actually I didn't. I wanted some. I wanted one of my favorite writers to write the stories. But Arthur gave me the opportunity and. Uh, uh, it was a good chance. Now, the thing is, I always felt myself more of a storyteller than a writer. I was telling stories through storyboards, uh, and so moving to scripts seemed to be a logical progression. And also, I had the, uh, the benefit of knowing how Filmation made shows, so I would write my stories to kind of be easier to produce. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't call for things that we wouldn't do. Uh, and that's basically my story. Thanks. Tom, did you have anything to add? Uh, I didn't want to be a writer. 
uh, <laughs> and I really, I really didn't write anything at Filmation. I preferred to work, like I said, Bob Forward, and I kind of did things. And we were, I don't know, we were just always up to stuff. And uh, and so it, it's like uh, when I came up with the the problem with power, it was because I was a Prince Valiant fan, and there was a Prince Valiant strip in the 50s where he threw away his sword and swore off being Prince Valiant or something like that. Well, that makes sense for He-Man. Why don't we do something like that? So I fed the story to Bob. Bob went and pitched it to Arthur, and they did it. Um, Bob and I did things that uh, like on the Brave Star film, we decided it needed a backstory, so without any authorization whatsoever, we came up with the backstory of, of uh, Brave Star. I, I was directing the movie, so I put it in the movie, and then we decided we'd let Arthur know about it. That didn't go over terribly well for, for reasons you can understand. And, uh, but I, I, I was always looking for what's different, and that's probably how Bob became a writer, I believe, because he did something, at some point he did a story that was about, you wouldn't think to do an origin story of He-Man's mother. And he did one, and she was an astronaut from Earth, and it was just different enough, and outside of the established canon, that it got recognized, and that sort of opened the door, like, oh, well, we can do stuff. We can do stuff that's a little different, and if, we've, if it entertains us. And like Bob and I, went, probably the high point slash low point was this thing called Salaxian Wars for Shira. And I came up with this idea, I go, God, look at all this stock footage we've got of people fighting and all this stuff. Let's write a show where we use every single action scene we can find. And we're just going to have a battle. It's a Slaxian war. And there was this character called Huntara that we were going to do in it. And of course, because we had since learned that if somebody gets killed in a Saturday morning or daytime TV show, you might just win an Emmy. And so that was kind of our goal on that. We saw, and we'll have this, this lady's husband get killed. We'll do that. So we, got, we went to work on that. And Arthur was going along with it and everything. And then the psychologist, that, or psychiatrist, what was he? Uh, he was neither. He was a communications... Uh, Don Roberts you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. He was a communications professor at Stanford. Okay, well, we consider him the enemy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I would like to put in a, 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 an opposing view. Uh, well, I think, I think well, well, from my point of view. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, and, so, and he killed it. And he justifiably looking, he goes... And he said, well, look, all this stuff's been done, all these scenes. We're just taking them out of the fire. We're going to cut them together. It's going to be really exciting. And he goes, yeah, but there's a difference if you take a kid to an ice cream store and you give him pie and an ice cream cone, or if you give him the whole store. And I guess that's right in hindsight. But I still have the board to that. And Don Manuel had done it. It was really a good episode. It was pretty cool. But So that was sort of my foray into writing at Filmation. Since then, I've written things. But I, people say I write well. I just don't consider myself a writer. I just don't. It's not something I do. But since then, at Marvel and everything, I had the opportunity to kind of do whatever I wanted. So I did whatever I wanted and could write things and so forth. Uh, Robbie, what's your dissenting view on, on the child psychologist? Well, I've worked with Don Roberts many, many times. I met him on Filmation, and I've worked with him and many others in that same role. And he is, uh, in my opinion, uh, exceptionally story-friendly and as liberal as you can be in that role. I mean, he had a role to perform, which is there's so much regulation around children's television and so many, uh, for better or worse, there are people that, that have the position that children are this extremely uh, susceptible audience, can be so influenced and a special audience and have to be protected. And, you know, to wh whether you believe that or not is not the point. My point was if... if that's the world that we worked in, which we did. Uh, the controlling, the gatekeepers insisted on that. Uh, I think Don Roberts was uh, uh, really a cut above of the people with that background, whose job it was to be the uh, sort of protector of children from bad influence from scripts. I think uh, he, I, I mean, I agree with your point in general, but these people could be really frustrating to creative people. And, and when you're working on a script, it could be maddening because you'd want to do something that would be great storytelling and great drama. And, you know, you knew intuitively it wasn't going to really screw up kids. I mean, we all grew up watching, uh, you know, Bugs Bunny, uh, you know, and the Roadrunner hammering people on the head and all these, these things. And so, you know, we, we writers always have this intuitive uh, belief that we, uh, that kids, uh, we gave kids more credit, I think, than a lot of the gatekeepers did. So, uh, but I just think Don was, was by far the most reasonable and flexible 
And yeah, I think he had a great story sense, actually. He gave me some, some really great ideas throughout my years of, of working with him. So that's my well, I, I just want to clarify. I don't. Well, there were I, I, I was there just being a glib to... kind of Detroit guy. And, uh, <laughs> well, you? Uh, I, 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 never, I never met the guy, but I would have to say he's, I'd have to credit him with probably helping save the animation industry back then because we had people. We had people like you know, asshats like Phyllis Shafley running exactly. around and people like that. that. I mean, they were just out of control, and we knew what to do. Or, or there was one named Thomas Rudecki, I'll never forget this, who came up uh, before a single episode of He-Man had been aired, and I think possibly even before I, I wrote the pilot script, the very first script, and I think this happened even before I'd written the first script, he was out with articles in Time Magazine criticizing this uber-violent show for kids and how bad it was gonna be. And I mean, it, he, he couldn't possibly have known anything about the show. And so that's what we were up against. Before a single episode went on the air, we had people attacking us because of you know, the bad influence we were gonna be on kids. And the irony was that uh, people like Lou Scheimer and Arthur were so committed to, to uh, uh, presenting a positive message for kids. I remember a story where I had a script where I had He-Man crawling on a branch out to save somebody and the branch broke and he fell and grabbed something. And Arthur made me take it out of the script because he man would never break a branch on a tree. I mean, that's the, uh, that, this is a true story. So, so and then you, know, you, 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 you live that experience and you read these articles by Thomas Radecki in Time Magazine about how evil we all were. So I think that's probably what, yeah, what and, you're and talking and about. If well, I can, uh, I don't want to. Phil Mason did have a thing about trees. I wrote an episode for a fat hour about Paul Bunyan it was all about Paul Bunyan. They got the script, and he says, there's a shot here where he, Paul Bunyan's cutting down a tree. I said, well, it's Paul Bunyan. <laughs> and they said, so we compromised. The tree had to be already cut down before the scene started. Yeah. Well, so it, just, just to go, I don't want to commandeer your thing, but it, I think it's important to know that I think stuff like that, like Luz and Arthur and... Uh, Don Roberts, Don Roberts, yeah, uh, yeah Don Roberts. They, they preserved it because it took the heat off of the industry because yeah. there was a seal of approval on everything. And so it, de it diffused it because these people were seriously way out of control. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was valuable. I never met the guy, you know, like I said, we're an artist, we just want to do you what we like wanted. You would like him. I, 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 and and they were like organically him. this way. It wasn't just Lou was worried. They really didn't want the tree cut down and they really, and, and Arthur really didn't want that. And nothing really to do with these outside people. That was really their philosophy. Absolutely. It, well, well, if you want to look like where Arthur's mentality came from, there was an old show, God, none of you were even alive, called The Rifleman. And it was, oh, in, yeah. it was in the late 50s, early 60s. Chuck and, and Arthur was involved with that, with these guys, Gardner, Levy, Gardner, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very moralistic show, despite the fact he killed somebody every show episode. Yeah, it was like he made but, but it was about that. It was about a positive message. And that was Arthur's, those were Arthur's roots. And it came from that. And it, it, it came all the way through the writing of the show and everything. And if I can just editorialize it. I was telling people, these conventions, these power cons are really nice because the people, you people seem like genuinely nice people. And I like to think that part of that's due to these morals they stuck on the end of the shows, these little lessons somehow penetrated and made for a group that doesn't have the usual comic convention snark to it you know, or anything like that. <laughs> and so you guys deserve credit and they deserve credit. Except for the by guy the that way, just hit me with his sword, but yeah. I agree. Arthur Lee Gale was the person in charge of the writing staff, for those who didn't know that. So he, uh, he kept us in line. No, certainly the morals right. helped. I remember my mom saying she wouldn't have let me watch He-Man with the scary skeleton walking and things like that, except for those morals. I loved those morals at the end of every episode. And so it did, it did allow kids to watch an action show, you know, so glad, glad you did that. What was the best and worst thing about working at Filmation. Huh. I, wanna, I want each of you to answer. Broby, do you have thoughts on that? Well, the best thing for me was, you know, I went there not planning to be an animation writer. I was asked to write a Fat Albert script, and I didn't think I could do it, but I, I did it. And uh, then they hired me, and uh, uh, the best part was just writing a bunch of stuff. Um, and, then, uh, and then it led to me writing a lot of animation and at Filmation, I should say, at other than film agents, so I wrote a ton of scripts 
because of animation. I had a big career ahead of that, but I wrote a lot more scripts in animation, and whatever I wrote got on the air for the most part. But, uh, but let's talk about other things in filmation, which had nothing to do with the writing. So um, I was used to working uh, on live action television with, um, under a union contract where uh, uh, I would get paid residuals and so forth and all that. So what, that wasn't the case with animation, but nothing to do with filmation. That's just the way it was in animation, still is. So the worst part was spending two weeks writing a script, and then the voice actors would come in and spend a half an afternoon, and they would get all kinds of residuals. Mm -hmm. It always uh, bothered me, but that's, that, that was how it is. They were, they were great people, a lot of fun, but I always, it always bothered me to this day that they're probably still getting residuals, and, except from France, they're not getting that. But the other great thing about Filmation was when it was all over, when Filmation closed down. It was really sad because we all looked back and we all appreciated what a true family we had there. Right, Pam? It was, uh, we, I remember we had a, a surprise birthday party for Arthur and Nadell. Was, was Filmation still around at that point? No, it was gone. And Arthur was truly touched. And it was, people came from all over just to get back together again to give him a surprise. And it was a great uh, family there that we, I, I don't think we, any of us appreciate it as much as when it was all over, but uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of work. And uh, Arthur, uh, so, you know, I was really kind of fish out of water, and I wasn't really good with filling out my time card. And Arthur was really into, you know, if you, t if you leave five minutes early, if everybody left five minutes early, you know, you're really stealing from the company. Well, I can't tell you how many times I, would, I crossed... Uh, Sherman Way and Arthur was coming from across the street, you know, five minutes before the um, uh, time clock was. So I was bad at that. I was also bad at Arthur coming into my office. But it was always during the break, and my legs would be sticking out from under the desk taking a nap. The other great things about filmation were Pam and Joyce. One of them is in the audience who's very shy, so I won't point her out. But when I would write a funny script, I hear her laughing because uh, 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 she was retyping everything into the Radio Shack computer. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was an odd experience for me because I was used to being treated in a very high level, you know, no time car card, certainly, and uh, doing whatever I want. When, when you would finish a script at Filmation, Arthur would expect you to start the next script five minutes later. And I just couldn't do that. I, I started wandering around going upstairs to the storyboard department and all of that. Uh, so the other problem was a tight budget. So when I wrote the, my infamous greatest show on Eternia, it required, you know, uh, uh, we had very tight budgets, and they, they had this, this required additional characters, um, uh, uh, more backgrounds. It probably added about $5.50 to the budget. So uh, uh, there was always these budgetary considerations. But all in all, it was a lot of fun and, uh, and gave me, and the other interesting thing, I've had all these wonderful, bef before I wrote these cartoons, I wrote all these very big, you know, glamorous television shows. Well, nobody really remembers those shows anymore for the most part, but they, when I, uh, I, I do uh, e-commerce websites now, and kids who were, who were watching the shows when I was a little kid, are now the CEOs of these companies that decide who they're going to hire to do a website. And my Fat Albert, my He-Man, my Ninja Turtle stuff helped seal the deal when I, with these uh, CEOs who were like five years old when they were watching <laughs> these uh, cartoons. That's right. uh, best, and, best and worst of filmation, Robbie. Yeah. Well, Robbie covered quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, every place I've ever worked, they say it's a family. And filmation is by far the only place where that was completely true. And uh, it was just a really special, magical place. Um, I love the idea that everything was done in that building. I think that was the last place where that was true, where a cartoon from the first idea in your head, through script, through everything, to the final film was all done in that building. And I remember I just loved being able to sort of follow my script. I'm, I'm a very curious person, so I love being able to follow my script through every single department and talk to everybody that was doing everything from from the storyboard guys to, you know, to the in-betweeners, to the film editors, to the camera guys. I mean, I was, I was hungry for the knowledge and everybody was wonderful. And uh, so I love that sort of following the script business. And uh, I have to also say working for Arthur and then Lou, I worked directly for Lou after I worked for Arthur. And both of those men are just, uh, were 
just exceptional, exceptional human beings on, on every level. And uh, it's such a pleasure to work for people whom you respect and whom you think are smarter than you are because uh, I haven't had that experience uh, a lot in my life. And, and so that, that was fantastic. The worst thing about filmation was the regimentation, um, uh, as Roby alluded to. Very strict hours. Uh, you had to be there at 8.30 in the morning. There was a... a 15 minute coffee break at 10.30, there was lunch from 12.30 to 1.30, and you left at 5.30, and you got overtime if you worked after that, which, you know, as a writer was uh, a very odd, bizarre way to work, and uh, I'm, I'm not a morning person, I mean, it was a challenge for me to make this panel today, so for me to have to, <laughs> for me to, have to be there every day at 8.30 was absolute torture, but, you know, once I woke up about noon, it was a, it was a great, great, uh, fabulous place to work in every, every respect. Robert, best and worst. Okay, well, uh, echoing everything that's been said, the, the family atmosphere, it was a, a great place. I loved working with everybody. I loved being able to go around to the different departments and hang out with the background painters and see things. And, and I would talk to the cameramen to find out, okay, I, I have a shot I wanna do. Uh, how do you do that? And I talked to the camera guys who would actually have to shoot it and make the thing work. And then I go, okay, so I will, do it this way instead of that way because you guys can do this, you can't do that. So that was, that was great, that communication. Uh, uh, one of the best things was working with uh, Arthur Nadell. One of the worst things was working with Arthur Nadell. <laughs> when he liked my stuff, it was glorious and made me feel great. When we disagreed on something, it was not so, so fun. Uh, Arthur, wonderful man, uh, but he truly believed that, that um, Everything we were doing was for, for five years old and under. <laughs> and they wouldn't notice plot holes. They wouldn't notice inconsistencies from one show to the next. And I was a, I was a purist. I was like, when I was a kid, I, it bothered me that Mighty Mouse looked different in different episodes. He didn't, they didn't stay on model. So I would argue a point about, well, we established that in this episode, the character could do this. Glimmer can teleport then why would falling into a ditch be a problem? She could teleport out of the pit, right? He goes, well, I don't want her to teleport out of the pit because uh, that ruins the storyline. He goes, well, then we gotta, we gotta solve this. He goes, no, it doesn't matter. I go, yes, it matters. <laughs> and so we'd get in those kind of discussions and it would end badly because he would say, Robert, why are you fighting me on this? This is for five-year-olds. Rob. <laughs> yes, yes, that he would do this. <laughs> and I, I learned to fight it only so far, then acquiesce and do what I needed to do. But, so, but that, was the, that was the creative tension that existed there. Uh, but uh, right. it was a great place. And he had one note always, was DB. You oh, can yeah, do script, better. Which meant do better. It was the dreaded DB. When you saw DB on your script. I have to share one other. Can I just share a sure. quick, funny uh, Arthur story? My first days at Filmation, I was basically being auditioned. And every day I would turn in work at the end of the day, and he'd say, yeah, you can come back for one more day. And I'd do this the first three days. On Wednesday, he said, OK, you can come back through Friday. And this went on for a few weeks before I actually felt I had a job. But I used to notice every time I'd go into his office, I'd see an A with a circle on my, on my script, or whatever I'd turned in. I'd see A, and I'd think, oh, this is great. A, I'm getting an A getting all A's. This is, I've never gotten all A's in my life. This is fantastic. <laughs> and one day I came in and Arthur said, I saw the A and I'm getting ready to get my, you know, my praise. And he said, Robbie, this, this script is, is terrible. You've got all these problems. And blah, 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 blah. I said, but Arthur gave it an A. He looked at me and he said, that A is just for Arthur. It means I read it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm done. T uh, Tom, uh, best and worst at filmation. Well, uh, I have a different point of view than these guys. Um, see, I think the regimentation worked. Now, I'm an old hippie, and nobody <laughs> doesn't like to be told what to do more than me. But, but what it did is it, it created, I believe it created that family atmosphere you talk about. Because here's what happened. 1030, you were out in the parking lot at some horrible food truck. Everybody was out there, literally everybody. Was so, like recess, so, so you got to know everybody, and That's you true. found over time that you start going, God, why is why is Pam talking to that guy? I gotta talk to her about this. He's a real, he's a real jerk. Yeah, I mean, you started getting vested in people because you saw them all the time. Whereas other studios, you don't, because now it's more free form. People do what they want. 
And so as a consequence, like when we were at Storyboard, we would, there was, we would hung out, which I've never done anywhere else really. And we would hang out and, uh, well, Ford and I would drink, but uh, th th we, we, we like did things, we went to Comic-Con together, and we weren't particularly friends, we just worked together, and we had trips that I won't go into here. And, uh, but it, it's like, it, it did create the kind of atmosphere. The thing about the DB is interesting, because that's something, without having worked for Arthur, that I saw in scripts, and I took that with me. So when I, when I was running studios, and I would work with writers, I would use that, because I thought it was good. And I'd do something in the script, and they give it to a writer. And write, of course, writers hate that. They go, what's a Stevie? What's a Stevie? I go, it means do better. Well, why don't you just do it? I go, would you rather I wrote that your writing sucks? Or do you want, it means do something better. I can do it for you, but you, I want you to see what you come up with. So I thought that was a really useful tool of, of, to go with that. It was something that made complete sense to me. Um, you know, filmation was, uh, the best thing about it, I guess, was that it was like, you learned a skill and you were paid to do it. And that can't be underestimated now because, or undervalued now, because nowadays nobody does that. People come out of art school, they think they're some kind of geniuses, or they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. You didn't learn everything about anything. I've, I'm doing work these days for people and you talk to these directors, working with these directors, and they don't even know, they've never animated, they don't know how to time something, they can't even read exposure sheets, which is, something that's a technical thing but they just don't know but working there you knew everything you worked your way up Inflammation is probably why the animation business blossomed because Lou not only somehow discovered stumbled into syndication somehow but but also because at that point all the other television studios in town were closing down everybody was and by attrition we started getting all the good artists and so we were always trying to do better work and get better drawing and do better stuff and do better. And it was there for it. And to Lou's credit, Lou was a guy of, his threshold for quality was here, but he could recognize it. And it's kind of like you give somebody a piece of chocolate and you go, here, you want a piece of chocolate, Lou? And you go, this is a Hershey's Kiss. You like it? And you go, yeah, yeah, I like that. Oh, I like that. Oh. And, then, and, then, and, then, and then you'd give them, then you go, yeah, well, try this. Here's a, here's a Dove bar. You go, oh, that's better. I want that now. And then you give him Belgian chocolate, you go, this is better. And he, oh, he could recognize it, and he always wanted it, and he let us do it, because people, as I'm sure Rob can attest, people like Bob Ford and I, we were kind of pains in the ass. We were always pushing things. We were always trying to not get away with stuff. We weren't trying to sneak things through, but we were always trying to push it. We were always trying to do something else and go with it, which could bring us with, at loggerheads with Arthur. You know, because his job was to control it and get a product done, an episode a day. You know, that's basically what we were turning out. So you had to make sure that rolled. Uh, one thing that I noticed in doing my research is that uh, Gwen Wetzler, who uh, was going to be on this panel and unfortunately couldn't join us today, uh, directed some of your seminal episodes. Uh, she directed uh, Double-Edged Sword, which is Robbie's episode, and Not So Blind for Robert, and uh, The Problem with Power, which, uh, you know, all started with you, Tom. How would, would writers and directors actually work together on their episodes at all? What was the process like? N not in my case. Uh, no. Uh, no. We were really very busy, you know, doing our own thing. And I would sneak away whenever I could to see what else was going on. But I, I never remember working with the director. Yeah. The storyboard, I would go upstairs and, uh, and uh, say, is this okay? You know, and sometimes. Usually that was just an excuse to get away and go upstairs. But... Uh, uh, I I, uh, I didn't work with the director at all. I, would, I really wanted to speak to Gwen today because she did my uh, greatest show on Eternity. I was sure would love to get her feedback on what she thought when that script landed on her desk. You know, I think what most people think of as director, at least in the filmation system, I would look more, frankly, storyboard artist, to me felt more like a director because it was really the storyboard artist that would take our words on the paper and put it out into shots and really kind of lay out how the f finished film was going to look. And once the storyboard was locked, that really became the blueprint and everybody just kind of followed along with that storyboard. And so I had a lot of interaction with the storyboard department. Uh, a so, lot. So what did the director do? Uh, well, what? I mean, uh, Tom can answer that because he was one. But but I'm just, uh, I, I, I for me, I think I think somewhat in the filmation system, uh, director. I think a director oversaw the execution of the storyboard, but. Uh, my recollection was directors did not have a lot of input into the actual content. But Tom really should comment on that. And, on He-Man. On He-Man, anyway. Yeah, on He-Man, yeah, it was very much like that. Uh, the directors are more like 
supervising the show. And then, but once again, I don't want to sound like this sounds egotistical, Bob Ford and me. Um, we started breaking the rules. You know, I got promoted to a director and I just said, well, you're going to direct these things. And that put me in conflict with the storyboard supervisor because we were giving notes on what we wanted all of a right, sudden. which was not done at film. It, it wasn't done. Yeah. And we're saying, I, I'm the director and I want this and I'd give notes and we did. Yeah, you so, guys acted like directors. Yeah, we were directing. Sense. And yeah. so then all the other, yeah. the older guys, the older directors who they had their role and they were doing what they should, started upping their game. That's why the quality started rising because they go, well, who are these snot-nosed kids? What so they, they're getting all the kudos, all this stuff looks good because they're doing something. So they all started doing it and things started getting better and better and better because of that. Um, Gwen, on the problem with power, she knew, somehow she knew that I was sort of personally vested in the show. So she, she actually would bring me in. She'd say, well, what do you think? You think we should put shadows on this? And she worked with the layout supervisor, Crystal Klabundi, who was into it. And it was trying to make that show a little bit something apart because she recognized something about it. And somebody told me they actually did different music cues for that show. So there was something about it that they liked. But Filmation was very regimented. I mean, Pam can answer that and Patty. You know, like, my recollection is Arthur did not want writers talking to storyboard artists. That was my recollection. And we always said, well, what, what, what sense does that make? What makes good sense? Um, and to get something like that done, because you want to control it. And with writers, with all due respect to writers, I, I, I never met a writer that thought their deal was fair. I never met a writer who liked what anybody did with their show, except for Robbie. Thank you. A and and they, they all, they, I never met a writer who didn't think they could do better if they were the director. And so, it, it, Ro Robbie's smiling, he knows it's true. Um, it, and it, it, it's like, but you know, Robbie was nice. When I did my first storyboard, he actually came down and said he really liked what I did with it and all this kind of stuff. But that was pretty rare. We just weren't to do that. It was, it, isn't yeah, I remember uh, now when Arthur saying you do not talk to storyboard, mm -hmm. which is why I did as much as I could. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> there is, I there is definitely an atmosphere of the school principal there, and you know, you were. It was kind of fun to see what you could get away with, and in, in, you know, in, 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 a, in a nice way. And I, I really, I don't want to in any way, shape, or form denigrate Arthur because I really loved oh, him. I mean, he was, but he was kind of the stern taskmaster in the in the lovable way, and in the kind of way that it was fun to sort of see if you could. Uh, get away with stuff. Well, you're lucky he didn't put you on your script because I can't tell you the times that we'd go in the bathroom and Arthur would be reading a script at the urinal. So maybe that would have been his, his code for that. Uh, we're going to have Q&A in just a minute. So any of you who have questions, please line up at the microphone and we'll get to your questions in, in just a minute. Um, just one last note about sure. the director. You might be interested to know, directors didn't even go to the voice uh, recording session at Filmation. That was a separate yeah. thing altogether. Lou Scheimer was the guy that directed directed the voices. So the person that was the episode director wasn't even there for the, uh, for the voice recordings. And I'll, and I'll sure say something, not, as, not script to director, but storyboard and directors did work, especially when uh, things started changing and the directors were having more input on the storyboards. We would want to know, as a, as a board artist, who was directing the show, because we, we got to know the idiosyncrasies and preferences of each director and said, okay, well, I can do this if Ernie's directing it, I, I can do this. If Tom's directing it, I can do this. Uh, if, if Ed Friedman is directing it, and we would sometimes alter how we boarded the show from the script, depending upon which director was going to handle it. All right, let's get to our questions. Oh, this is Your great. first. All right. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say or thank you all. Uh, you guys really shaped my childhood, and uh, you guys were such an influence to me. Uh, growing up, the He-Man cartoon had such an impact on my life. Oh, it's wonderful so to hear that. Thank, thank you. That you. Thank too. you. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you guys mentioned before how you guys were kind of restricted when you were doing your story writing, or and you had to hold back. And so now I'm asking, reflecting after all these years, um, if you could, how far would you have gone to your shows? Like, would you have done a little more mature levels like we see now in animation? Or would you guys have gone full Game of Thrones type? <laughs> that, that's a really interesting question. And uh, for me, everybody will have their own answer. My answer is I would have gone a little further, frankly, just because it would have made my job easier. I mean, uh, I think when you can uh, threaten violence and have more violence, it's, hard to, it, it's, it's very hard to create drama, suspense, and jeopardy without uh, violence, to be honest. And I, I mean, I'm not a violent person, but, uh, and I don't 
I don't like gratuitous violence, but we weren't even allowed to do violence that was not gratuitous. Even in good service of story, we were very restricted. So I would have done more, and same with comedy. I mean, there were things, you know, I think a lot of great comedies in terrible taste, and I, I like bad taste. So uh, <laughs> I, would have, I would have done more. Would a I? little bit, but I mean, but always, I mean, I think gratuitous is the appropriate word. I would not have, I, I mean, I never supported gratuitous violence, and I wouldn't really want to do anything that I absolutely believed would have had a bad effect on anybody. So that would have been my personal limit. And when I became an executive later, I, l later in my career, I sort of took what Arthur's role was. Uh, and so it was my job to make these decisions. My criterion was always, I expected to get a letter from a viewer. And I, I, f I felt if I could answer the letter in good conscience, I allowed it. And if I felt I couldn't answer the letter in good conscience, I said no. And that was, yeah. that was the uh, rule of thumb that I used. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question I, or not. I, yeah. I guess if something could have been pushed, I would have gone more for the emotional end. Because the shows were almost bereft of any romance at all, which happens between people, the genuine affection hey, of... Hey, Dawn of Dragoon. <laughs> uh, but you know, you know, and so, and that's probably why. I mean, people, fans have talked to me about like the end of the the problem with power, where He Man's carrying Tila away, and they, it, there's no romance there, but it's a tender moment. There was something to that, and like, there's a show that people seem to like that I directed in Shira called Sweepy's Home. And it was just because there was this character Frosta that was flirting with He Man, so it tells you there was something to be done in there that, that we probably could have done. But it, once again, it was great training because just on my own thing, after I left there, then I ended up running Marvel and stuff. And I did shows like Biker Mice from Mars, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, The Hulk, all testosterone. That's what they were. But and I was completely unsupervised. I could do whatever I wanted because it was syndicated. Never got notes from anybody. Just did whatever I wanted. But Filmation trained me how to police ourselves. We never did anything that got us in trouble. We never got letters. We never had gratuitous violence. We understood the rules, which I think is good. We're not out there to show kids how to kill somebody on a cartoon show. We're there to tell a story. It's a fairy tale for them. That's a nice fairy tale. All right, next question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. A bit repetitive yes. here. I apologize. So let me get this. Um, there's so much I can say about Filmation, but like the gentleman said before, thank you. I think of names like um, Hollingsworth, Morse, um, Donald Chanel, all these names that we show up at the beginning of the shows I love, like Shazam and Isis. And so thank you guys so much for all those wonderful stuff. Um, there was a show after, after He-Man was Brave Star, and there was an episode called Spin. It's about a drug, and at the end, the little boy died. And so listen to what you were saying about how difficult it was to show these things. Was that a very hard episode to, to get past or to have... Um, uh, you know, the filmation people, you know, authorized was a lot of difficulty getting that one on the air. Well, I didn't work on that show, but I can t I can extrapolate and tell you I'm sure it was. I mean, it was a rare, it was a big deal. If you were going to, if you were going to have somebody die, it was going to be a very big deal and a very special episode, and there had to be a really good reason for it, and we would work in very close conjunction. Every filmation show had a sort of psychological advisor, whether it was Don Roberts, whom we discussed earlier, or another man from UCLA named Gordon Berry. He was on Fat Albert. He had that role on Fat Albert. And so uh, there, was a, there was a Fat Albert episode where somebody died, and that was a big deal. And later on, we did a G.I. Joe episode with Bob Forward, who was the guy that did Brave Star. He kind of did the same drug killing somebody okay. on a G.I. Joe episode. And it was a really big deal, and we had to pay very close attention to it. So I think the answer to your question is I'm sure on Brave Star was yes. OK, thank you. All right, next question. Hi, um, I wanted to say that I love He-Man, even though it was for boys, I always felt like it was for me. Um, and um, I have two questions. Um, I just started ghostwriting. So when you say you used to write a lot of words, how many words per day or per month is that? What's a lot to how you? How many words per day? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think I would do six pages a day. Okay, so that's 250 that pages I always liked the page. section where I would pull off the existing page that says the transformation from to He-Man, that was a great, that took care of one of my six pages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I counted that. And I always try, I had at least two, I always try to stick a third one in, because it took a while to write those things. But we would write, a, I think, a script in two weeks, I think. Arthur would like it more sooner, including rewrites of previous scripts. So that's how it kind of was, as I recall, with, with Fat Albert, I mean with He-Man and Fat Albert. <laughs> 
Cool. So uh, how many What's words? Your other question? You know? My other question is, um, you talk, um, talked about continuity errors. And did you have a system in place for making sure those didn't happen? Robert? <laughs> <laughs> that one's to you. Do you mean from script to script or from within script? episodes? Both. <sighs> well, I think, I think it was sort of a, a collective job. I mean, Arthur, mm -hmm. Arthur was supposed to have an overview of all the scripts. He was the guy that read every script. And so I guess it was his job. And I mean, it was, it was everybody's job. I mean, we were all supposed to know the series and know the lore. And I think some people were more on top than others. Well, Rob, Rob was obviously uh, That was a pet peeve of mine. But, yeah. <laughs> but what happened is we would get copies of storyboards when it was a storyboard of other people's boards. And we'd get copies of other people's scripts to read them to keep uh, abreast of what was going on in, in the show. But the, one of the, the difficulties were that, uh, especially in He-Man and She-Ra, there were several scripts in production at the same time. We had uh, uh, three to four staff writers, and then we also had freelance writers. And so, again, a half a dozen to eight episodes may be in various stages of production at the same time, so you wouldn't know what another writer was writing. So and would you be working on episode eight when you hadn't even read seven yet? Yes. Well, ba it. back then it was a different time. It was a simpler time. Uh, to me, He-Man, She-Ra, all that stuff was pretty much bereft of continuity. There were characters established. I don't want to say how highfalutin, like, yeah, we had a plan. They, they, were, <laughs> they were standalone episodes. They really were. You understood the characters. The yeah. characters are continuity. But I don't really recall a bunch of shows referring to other ones. Do you guys, like, oh, remember when, remember when you did this? You know, skeleton. There were a few. Well, I mean, there some, few. but not, not really. Well, not, I, I remember not really. when I put Monty Turnia into a script, and I think it was you who called me into his office. As you know, we've never had a Monty Turnia in this entire series, Mr. Gorin. Well, how are we going to put this one in? And I said, uh, well, when you're looking in the castle, there's a window there. There's a really <laughs> window that was never seen before. There was one. Well, that's where Monty Turnia is. I had no idea what He-Man was about when I started. I, I, it was Friday. Arthur says, Monday, come in with the premise. He gave me a bunch of scripts. And this Bible, which was so hard for me to understand, so I just took uh, He-Man was Fat Albert with muscles. Um, <laughs> Tila was Pam Vincent. Skeletor was uh, Bill Cosby on a bad day. <laughs> He, 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 he was not all smiles when the cameras were not on him. That's for sure. And uh, I was uh, Orko. So I, I really had no idea. I finally, got, maybe into my third script, so you probably got two of my scripts when you were, uh, that uh, I kind of understood what the show was about. But then by the time I did The Greatest Show on Eternia, which uh, I was out of filmation writing Berenstain Bears, so uh, uh, the continuity was a... Thank you for your question. I didn't know what the show was about. I didn't know what man at arms even meant, you know, so uh, I, I was very confused. All right, next question. Thank you. Thank but you. I wrote them anyway. Okay, first of all, I want to say thank you all so much, your heroes, for making, pouring your heart and souls into something that is, means so much to so many, including thank myself you. and my thank three daughters. You. It's really nice to hear that. Thank you. Um, my, I, my question, and Tom touched on this a little bit, is. Um, uh, what, were there restrictions when it came to romance in, in the He-Man and She-Ra shows? You know, we, my, the, some of the best episodes, like Into the Abyss, you know, seemed like kind of a date with Adam and, and Tila there. <laughs> but you, you never, in the hundreds of episodes of He-Man and She-Ra, He-Man and Tila, they never kiss or they never enter into a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. And when you think of superheroes, every superhero you can think of, Superman, Batman, you know, they all have a romantic interest. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, if Adora can print Kiss Seahawk, what's going on with He Man and Tila? Well, you should have seen what was in the storyboard office on the wall. <laughs> the script. You know, I, I don't remember really pressure not to write romance, although I think whatever pressure there was to not have it was the belief that this show was targeted for young boys. And I do kind of believe that young boys kind of go, you know, you know they, I think, I think. I believe young boys kind of want action more than romance. Having said that, I, I, I was joking to Tom, but I wrote an episode called Dawn of Dragoon, which had Orko having a romance with Driel, which, uh, and that was very much a romance, and it was intended to be a romance, and at the end of the show, they do this thing that I made up called Show Face, where they lift up I, their veils. I love that moment, thank you. Yeah, well, and that was, that was really my way of trying to uh, uh, sell sex in a way that would get, <laughs> that would get past uh, you know, the censors, and be permissible for uh, 
And I did a fat opera that way too. That was I actually did a fat opera about sexually transmitted diseases that was targeted for you know twelve year olds, and that was a challenge. So so I didn't really perceive a, 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 a ban against romance per se, but I do. I guess I guess there was a belief amongst some of us that that it would be a turnoff for for boys for our uh, audience. Sadly, we have run out of time, but let's thank our amazing panelists. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm right, a military and next, guy, and uh, I just wanted to tell you guys thank you for your service to our country. Um, you guys did something that I don't even think you understand. I cried when I met Skeletor for a half hour, and uh, I love all of you, and thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.